It was these pictures on this very cruise ship that got me thinking about things like this that make absolutely no sense on a cruise ship. And it was time to go and explore them. By the way, if you're new here, welcome aboard. My name is Gary Bembridge and my goal is to make it more fun and even easier to discover, plan and enjoy unforgettable cruise vacations. I was scrolling through some cruise photographs the other day and I came across a photograph of me looking rather dapper in a dinner jacket tuxedo, but I couldn't for the life of me remember where I'd taken it and what ship I was on until today when I boarded this ship, the Saga Spirit of Discovery, came into my cabin and saw these pictures. It was on this very ship in a cabin like this that I'd taken the picture, but I had no recollection of it because I don't remember the artwork on a cruise ship. I never noticed the artwork around a cruise ship, and I certainly never choose a cruise based on the artwork. And yet, for cruise lines, artwork is a massive, huge big deal, and they spend an absolute fortune on it. Let's take a little look at what actually happens. In an interview with Travel Weekly magazine, Royal Caribbean Group estimated that they have over $142 million of art on their ships. That's over $6 million per ship. They have an incredible $52 million on celebrity ships. They have over 14,000 different items of art on a celebrity ship, for example. Now this ship, Saga Discovery, which is quite a small ship, they have 1,000 pieces of art and 400 of those were specially commissioned from British artists when the ship was built. It's become a massive big business. The owners of the lines or even the CEOs, so for example, Frank Del Rio of Norwegian Group, personally used to choose the artwork across all of their ships until it became just too big a thing to do. Now, I was once on a naming ceremony for a ship and I met a lady who worked for an art consultancy that specifically works on sourcing art for cruise ships. It's a massive big business. The amount of money involved is enormous. Artwork has taken a life of its own for the cruise lines. So for example, I was on a recent cruise on Viking Venus and they had a coffee table book of all the art on the ship and they even had an app where you could go around and look at all of the art across the ship, which would take hours to do. On Hapag Lloyd, which I was on a couple of years ago, they had a gallery with the artwork. They even had a full-time person that would come on board from the consultancy who would then host art walks around the ship. The lines engage these various consultants to generate and create art for them. So for example, Princess Cruises has worked with Bronson Fine Arts in Los Angeles. Norwegian Cruise Line works with Atlanta-based Soho Myriad over the years. Art is integrated in other ways on board ships. So for example, on Celebrity, they have a partnership with Hollywood Hot Glass where they create glass blowing creations which you can actually get involved in making. Oceania cruises on two of their ships, Marina and Riviera, they have an artist loft where they have an artist in residence. Even here on Saga, they have a small gallery with rotating exhibitions by the different artists who've contributed to the art on the ship. Do you notice the art on board? I certainly couldn't even remember the pictures in my cabin. If you ask me what the picture was in the last cabin I was on, I couldn't tell you. And the question I would have is, does it make sense or would it be better to take that money and put it into perhaps some of the facilities in a cabin that we would notice? Another thing that for me certainly makes very little sense on a cruise ship linked to art is the art auction. I have loads of people contacting me asking me around what is the story about art auctions. Well, it's massive big business on cruise ships. The main provider of those art for art auctions is a company called Park West Gallery. They have sales of over $400 million a year. And you can find them online, certainly at the time of recording, like Celebrity, Norwegian, MSC, Princess, Royal Caribbean. The way it works is they have perhaps some talks on the art. They might have a big champagne reception. They might have a raffle and they get punters on the cruise ships to pile in and bid on the art. Now, it's not without some controversy at all. Bloomberg, for example, reports that there are at least 21 lawsuits with people suing Park West over having overpaid for art on board. There's lots of discussion around just how good the art is on board. The companies tend to sell three things, either original artworks by up and coming artists or perhaps even more well-known artists, limited edition prints signed by the artist, and thirdly, other limited edition prints which are perhaps not fully endorsed by the artist because they might have passed away. Of course, these are auctions. So the price you pay is what you bid on those. However, 
for me, it doesn't really make sense. Why would you go on a cruise ship, on a vacation, buy art where you have no way of independently verifying what it is, checking the prices? To me, it makes no sense at all. I can see that it does make some sense because it generates a lot of profit for the cruise lines and certainly the companies that own them. What do you think about that one? Do you think that makes sense on a cruise ship or not? I'm almost certain that you're going to have an issue with these next two things that do not make sense on a cruise ship. And that's because I've already seen a study by a group called Oceana, which lobbies for the preservation and protection of the ocean, that says 75% of cruise passengers agree that this makes no sense. And so it's likely to be even higher amongst non-cruise passengers. And it all hinges on what happens behind that door that's behind me over there. And it's all around when you want to go and what happens after you've been. First, let's talk about the toilet system. There are four key differences you'll notice when you're on a cruise that are different to on land. First of all, you have to close the seat before you can flush the toilet. So lots of people probably find that a big plus and see that as something that definitely makes sense. And that's because the button to push is behind here. Now, when you push that button, the second thing you'll notice is sometimes there's a slight pause before it goes. And then you'll hear this sound. There's like a and then a and that's because the system here is a vacuum system. So it's not like the systems on land. So you may think it makes no sense for them to have a very different toilet system. Well, actually, up until the 1970s, it was the same system as used on land, but that meant it used an enormous amount of water. If you think how much water is used when you flush the toilet. And water is an incredibly precious commodity. They actually used to, at one point, use seawater, but that created lots of problems with rustings of pipes. So actually, this system does kind of make sense. Also, what's important about it is it means that it can have smaller pipes, so less space, and also can move the business up, down, sideways, and around about, so it doesn't rely also on downward pressure. So it does make sense from that perspective. Interesting enough, by the way, the vacuum system was originally part of the Electrolux company who created some of the products that were used by cruise ships, as a little aside. There is, however, one really big downside with this system for all the pros, and that it's because it's got really small pipes and because it's a suction system, it's extremely sensitive if anything else other than kind of what's supposed to go down there goes down there. So if people throw anything else down there, the chances because of those small pipes, the whole system gets clogged up. And I've been on quite a few cruises where you know the whole stretch of cabins has had a problem, the toilet won't work, and they've had to yank everything out to clear the blockages. So from that sense, it makes no sense to have such a sensitive system, although it does work within the cruise ship and saves water. So assuming there's no blockages or the blockages get sorted out and the waste makes its way through the system, what happens next? Well, in the olden days, and until actually surprisingly recently, most of the sewage that was generated on ships, whether it's cruise ships or maritime ships, ended up in the ocean. And it wasn't until pretty recently, in fact, as late as 2003 that new regulations came in and it's under the auspices of the International Maritime Organization. They introduced a thing which is called MARPOL 4 and it's MARPOL 4 convention and it aims to reduce and control the pollution from sewage that goes into the ocean. Now these rules are as follows and bear in mind this applies to cruise ships as well as all the other ships out there sailing. It says after you 12 miles away from land and traveling at least four knots, you can release untreated sewage into the ocean. Between three and 12 miles, you can only release it if it's been through an approved treatment process and system. And within three miles or less, you can't release anything into the ocean. And of course, you can pump it out on land. Now, that sounds pretty scary when you consider that the US Environmental Protection Agency, they estimate that in a week, long cruise of 3,000 people, say 2,000 passengers, 1,000 crew, that will generate 150,000 gallons of sewage. That's enough, they say, to fill 10 kind of backyard swimming pools. So bear in mind all the amount of ships that are out there sailing, does that mean that that huge amount of sewage is heading into the ocean? Well, the good news is that whilst maritime ships, so cargo ships or whatever, may follow that rule, the cruise lines do not follow that rule. They come under another voluntary rule, which is under the auspices of CLEAR, the Cruise Line International Association. And this says that no sewage will go into the ocean unless it's been through a treatment system. So cruise ships have a system 
where sewage goes through, or it's known as black water, goes through four different stages of treatment, which includes bacteria, UV, filters, all sorts of things. And basically it ends up with water that's as near as you can imagine to drinking water, believe it or not. And I've certainly been on ships and seen that whole process. So that is what is released into the ocean. So basically what is argued is the water from sewage is processed to basically be equal to the water that's in the ocean. Now, a lot of people are still skeptical about that. And certainly people have seen some companies fined for infringements. Although interestingly, it's not been infringements for sewage. It's been infringements for either releasing oily water. So Princess was fined over $40 million in 2016. Carnival was fined $20 million in 2019 for disposing of plastic waste in the ocean. But the treatment of sewage seems to be under much more control. And that's been verified, for example, Alaska, which has really strict rules, does spot checks on ships. And in their last test, they found 98% of cruise ships were following the procedures and they had water that was of that grade that was ready to be released into the ocean. Other groups like the Friends of the Earth are less convinced and they actually track this whole area and they every year release a scorecard. And if you want to find out more about the scorecard and see how different cruise lines and ships actually perform, I've got a link in the description or this is what, where you can go and have a look at. Another area which people feel make no sense on a cruise ship and causes a huge amount of angst is in the area of dress codes. In fact, even as recent in the last couple of years, the Washington Post had an article called How Dress Codes Are Tearing Passengers Apart. And certainly on the channel, I see loads and loads of comment and discussion and ranting about dress codes. Now, in the olden days of cruising, dress codes were a fundamental part of cruising, but so was life, whether you went on airplanes, trains, or even out to the cinema or theatre, people dressed up. Things have changed, people argue. And people now expect to be able to dress down, dressed casually, and they go crazy with dress codes. Some of the lines, which actually tend to be more British lines, have really strict dress codes. So p Cruises, which I'm on right now, as I record this, Cunard Cruises, Fred Olsen, they have really strict dress codes with formal nights where people wear dinner suits, beautiful gowns, tuxedos, whatever. However, there's a growing push against it. So we're seeing many other lines, whether it's Carnival, Holland America, Celebrity, change their formal nights into nights like gala nights, celebration nights, dress your best if you want nights. Many people feel that it no longer makes any sense to have dress codes on a cruise ship and they should better reflect what happens on land. However, dress codes have now become part of the brand. So a line like Cunard, which wants to recreate that sense of magic of the crossing areas in the 50s and 60s of glamour, they keep dress codes as a fundamental part of what they do because it's what they want the brand to stand for. On the other degree, we have Norwegian Cruise Line that really wants people to feel relaxed and comfortable and lets people wear things like shorts around and about, even in the evenings for dinner and stuff like that. So dress codes have become an area that people feel make no sense. The feeling is that the modern man, the modern woman today, wants to be able to dress as they choose, dress as they please. And at the end of the day, many people argue, I'm paying to be on a ship. Why are you telling me what I have to do? So that's certainly an area that people feel make no sense. Personally, I quite like a dress code. I do like a, like a bit of dressing up, but that's me. And I guess what people are saying, it should be a matter of choice. If you want some thoughts on some other things that make no sense on a cruise ship, why don't you watch this other video where I look at six key things that make no sense on a cruise ship on top of the ones that I've already discussed here. So why don't you click on those and take a look, including one which explains to you why swimming pools are so small on cruise ships. See you over there.